Hey everybody, Judy Seeger here, your host for the Happy Healthy Holiday Summit. So glad to have you guys back with another great interview that I'm so excited to share with you guys. Uh, we have on here our expert, uh, Sas Simone. Thank you so much for being on here today. It's my pleasure. I'm so excited and honored. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And he's going to be getting into how to make friends with your mind and learn to listen to your heart because during the holidays, our mind goes one way, our heart goes another, and we don't know how to bring it back into focus. And Sa is going to guide you through his expertise in meditation in a way that is so soothing and so connective, you're going to really feel it. So very excited to have you on here. First of all, Sa, before we jump in, I want to introduce you a little bit about where you've been, what you have been up to, and all that stuff. So you're actually a meditation teacher. Um, best-selling author, transformation coach, born in Brazil. You got that little Brazilian flair going on, right? Um, and you came to the U.S. at 16, and you got into the fashion industry, but looks like that really was tough on you because it led you down that path of addiction, depression, and all that stuff. I can imagine a highly competitive industry, right? Mm -hmm. But you walked away, and you figured out how to get back on track by going to really cool places. Some of them I've been to. They've been to Nepal, India, Thailand. I was in Thailand for four months. Indonesia, I was in Indonesia. Um, mm. And you figured out a system that works. And I'm really, really happy that you're taking the time to share what you've learned because not only have you healed from your own path, but you're gonna show us how to make sure that we get on that right path and stay on the path, especially during the holidays, right? It's insane. It's like wow. getting more and more crazy. So, so let's start out, first of all, um, with meditation as far as what is, what is meditation and why is it so super important? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this question. Um, in short, meditation helps us to get used to the mind, you know, get used to the waves of the mind. And it's a simple way that we learn to concentrate the mind and gather all the energy of the mind into a single point. And what happens when we learn to pay attention our relationship to life changes. Our relationship to ourselves changes. Our relationship to everyone and everything starts to, to be upgraded simply because we're not taken by everything the way it is, you know, normally is. A thought arises in our mind, positive or negative, we're, we're taken by it. A negative thought arises, we're judging that negative thought, and then we get, we judge the judgment, and then we spiral out of that, and then our whole body is inflamed, our amygdala is, you know, is going full power, cortisol is pumping through our body, and then we freeze or we want to have, you know, fight against it. Um, and then our lenses of the world goes from being wide, it goes to being just like this. And all of a sudden we're seeing life through this little lens and this, you know, short-sighted view of the world where we're not, we're not able to be creative. We are reactive. So meditation in short, in the most simple form, helps us to train our mind to do one thing, um, which is to learn how to breathe, you know, reconnecting with our breath. There's, there's, there are many kinds of meditation out there. The, most, the, the two fields that have been most researched and talked about is the Vipassana in, in Buddhism, right? Because the word mindfulness also comes from, from, from a Buddhist practice. It's a Buddhist background. Um, and I know some people like to keep it in a secular, so they won't mention the background. But because I've studied in Nepal and in India, uh, the traditional path to meditation, I do like to to say that there is, you know, a, in simple form, it comes from, you know, Buddhist literature. So there's two main paths, the concentration path and the mindfulness path. The concentration path is what I love to get people to start on, which is to learn how to pay attention to your breath. And you know, when it was said that the Buddha was doing uh, this practice of mindfulness of breathing or awareness of the breath uh, for the last 10 days before he became fully awake. And awake, being awake, and not confused or clear and not confused is in short like we're not taken by our painful memories when they arise we're not taken by um uh, everything that arises in the mind the same way our relationship to ourselves and our thoughts and our memories and life in general changes we have that space that we talk about right and each time you get to come back into that space you're dropping to your heart and when you drop into your heart you have access to the language of the heart which is compassion kindness creativity, goodness, benevolence. And the beautiful part of it all this is we talk about it from a spiritual vocabulary. And then you look from the scientific vocabulary, they say that these qualities that I just mentioned that live in the heart 
are qualities that are associated with different parts of the brain. And these different parts of the brain actually grow in size. There's research from this beautiful uh, neuroscientist called Sara Lazar. She's a neuroscientist from Harvard. And she, her research shows that when you do drop into the heart, she doesn't use this vocabulary. This is my translation of the neuroscience, right? When you do get to concentrate the mind and achieve the single point of concentration, which for us would be the breath, and I'll guide you guys to a simple practice, uh, the prefrontal cortex grows in size and the amygdala, which is the stress response in the brain, decreases in size. The part of her research and part of the vocabulary says that the prefrontal cortex is the the happiness CEO in the brain. How cool is that, that we can actually grow its size? And her research shows that it's only eight weeks that you can do that. And there's four main meditation practices. And the one that I want to talk to you guys today, um, and I say four main within my tradition, right? There's thousands of different practices out there. And I want to share with you guys what I've uh, been studying within contemplative psychotherapy. And we've seen, uh, you know, a lot of uh, scientific research to back them up to actually change the architecture of your brain to redesign your nervous system to get you to learn to pay attention to life and have access to your heart like this okay um can i guide a little practice yeah i just want to ask you one quick question yeah. and when you were fighting all this because now of course you're in the zone you know how to do this you've been doing this for a long time but when you were in that really intensive competitive industry the fashion industry yeah. and then you switched over to saying, hey, I need to learn mindfulness. I need to learn how to deal with all these, uh, the depression, anxiety, distress. Yeah. How did you navigate that? Because that's where a lot of people are stuck. They're like, okay, they're either on antidepressants, they're eating horrible food, they're drinking more, they're overweight, and so they're stressed, right? And they're uh, almost afraid of the change, even though they know it's better, and they know they have to stop this craziness. So how did you do it? And how can we give some tips on navigating in that interim? So if you're staying within, I mean, to, let me just backtrack for one second. I didn't really have an option. I was, I was bought out of the business in the fashion industry, you know, and while in the fashion industry, I was showing up to work every day, you know, showing up to work with anxiety, with, you know, ridden with depression. And not only would I, I was expecting myself to perform, I was expecting the people that I worked with to perform too. Um, and I was just, you know, very, I was unkind. And, um, and then when I spiraled out of the, out of the, you know, the, into depression, the pit was because I realized how unkind I had been to other people. And how unkind and through that was process. Was that just an offshoot of because you were feeling so crappy, yeah? Exactly. And we know this, you know, we hear this so often, but it, sometimes it doesn't land. It's like people, when people are mean to you, it's not something that's strictly to do with you. It's not personal to you. It has to do with how, how, much, how much suffering they are experiencing within themselves. And that's kind of hard, right? Because, you know, we get people are mean to us and we're like, oh, it's, it's, it's totally personal to me, but in truth is, it's just honoring like compassion, opening up to like, hey, this person might actually be in deep suffering. And that's where I was until much later when I started to meditate that I realized uh, that I was just, you know, in agonizing uh, internal chaos. That's why I was acting out in the way I was, you know, acting out. Um, but if you are, uh, if, you, if you're at the point right now where your job is what you need to do in this moment, there's four main things that I want to uh, talk about, which is primary foods, right? So primary foods are four areas of your life that you can nourish, uh, bring nurture, you know, nurturing into it, which is, it's like sprinkling the, the glitter into it or uh, watering these seeds in your life a little bit more. And the first one is movement. We have to find time to move the body. You know, it is in the contingency plan for enlightenment through the Buddhist literature. It is on the contingency plan for enlightenment through the yogic path. It is in all these ancient texts. We have to move the body. Uh, and then also you read into like the Alzheimer's research, like preventive uh, ways to make sure the brain is optimal uh, is to move the body. And I recommend 20 minutes a day, you know, just simply 20 minutes a day with an intention. You say, oh, I live in a city, so I walk and I do this like, Truth is, like, we have to not just, you know, um, say that the walk is your movement, but add in those extra 20 minutes where you're like, you know what, set that intention. And an intention um, becomes, you know, a part of a wellness ritual because the intention with the habit, it's, uh, you know, you can really set yourself free because you're sending yourself a message like, 
hey, I'm going to go on this walk because this is actually helping to set me free. This is actually helping to lift the, the veil of anxiety and depression from my life. So first thing is to uh, bring movement into your life. Um, and I know you probably talk about this a lot. And second thing is the spiritual practice. And spirituality is different for everybody, you know? And the spiritual practice that I'm, that I'm going to share, that I you know, uh, want to reinforce here, is simply like, how can you take a break from your story? How can you take a break from your narrative? What can you do every day that allows you to, to step back? And the stepping back is like, you know, we're so caught up in all the drama and all the chaos that's happening inside of us and outside of us. What can you do every day that gives you a little freedom? That gives you just a moment of witnessing, right? And, and I think in the field of psychology and science, they call it metacognition. So awareness of awareness. Right? Becoming aware that you're aware, becoming aware that, hey, perhaps my past doesn't define who I am. Hey, perhaps my mistakes do not define who I am. Hey, perhaps the moment, this moment of suffering that I'm experiencing right now doesn't define my life. You know? So, give us a specific practical tip on how to do that because everybody is always saying, okay, I understand what you're saying. I need to change yeah. something up. Yeah. But they just, they look at me or email me or call me and says, how do I do that? Exactly. So the how is the beautiful part. You can do this by training the mind to rest all of the energy of the mind into a single point. And it could be the breath, right? So, um, and in practical terms, the way we talk about meditation is most people can feel the, the vivid sensation of the breath at the tip of their nose. So it's either like, or other people feel the breath in the upper lip. Others more subtle, like the back of the throat. Or some people can connect with the feeling of the breath at the belly the movement of the belly rising and settling, or is it the chest, you know? And when you bring all the attention into the feeling of the breath, when the narratives arise in the mind and they're passing in the mind's eye, you're able to not get taken by them. And if you do get taken by them, you come back. You're training the mind to have a different relationship. That's mindfulness, right? Mindfulness is just helping us to change our relationship with, to life and to ourselves and to the world in general. Um, so being able to train the mind to a single point is the foundation to taking a break from your story. And Hey, if you're like, Oh, but the breath is so hard. I can't feel my breath. I, I don't, you know what I mean? I trust me. I've been there and I've, I, I hear you on this. So simple thing you can do. And I know it might be a little silly for some, for some, for some people, but let's just try it. It's just simply like part your lips as if you had a straw hanging from your lips. And then we're gonna breathe in through the nose. So breathing in through the nose all together like this. And then hold the breath at the top here. Hold yourself in and breathe out through the mouth. And breathe in through the nose. Hold the breath at the top. And breathe out through the mouth. And once again, deep breath into the nose. Hold at the top and out of the mouth. And then just take a quick scan of your internal landscape of, of your nervous system, see if there's any changes. And then we'll switch. And we're just gonna do three of each, right? And we'll switch. Now we'll breathe into the mouth. and hold the breath at the top and then out through the nose and breathe into the mouth hold here and then out through the nose and last one in through the mouth Hold the breath at the top and then out through the nose. I have never done it that way, Saad. That's very, very interesting. I like that. You can feel the difference when you're breathing through your mouth versus breathing through your nose. I li and you didn't even count nothing. You just in and out. That's simple. Mm -hmm. If you do want to count, um, it's breath in for five hold for two and out for six okay you know five so two and six okay five two six and then here's what it, you can do you can continue to increase you know you can do six in 
pulled for three, out for seven. Uh, see where you're at, you know, and also depends on your height, depends on your body size. It depends on, and there's, you know, all kinds of different things that depend. But I think this kind of format helps us to switch from, when we're completely trapped in our story, we are usually um, breathing anywhere from 12 to 16 times per minute, you know? This is what uh, doctors say. And the anxious, an ordinary anxious person is usually breathing at that rhythm. And it's right here, shallow breath, you know, continuously anxious, fear. And the shoulders get curved in, we're hunching over our computer. Yeah, yeah. So this breath, the simple breath, helps anyone to switch off and switch on the parasympathetic division of the nervous system, where it's resting and relaxing, you know? The heart, the heartbeat uh, slows down, digestive system kicks in, the belly breath starts to come in, and then we're breathing anywhere from four to five times per minute. And that's what they call a coherent breathing. That's when the brain and the heart are in more sync. And then and we how start often do you have to do that, Sal? I do it every day. Like just once a day, twice a day? I do it twice a day. And I, re I recommend everybody to try to do it twice a day. And my teacher, Dr. Richard Brown, who teaches uh, psychiatry at, the, at Columbia University, who I, who I learned this, uh, some of these breathing techniques from, he has taught at South Sudan refugee camps where people are extremely traumatized, you know, extreme case of trauma uh, from slavery to rape. I mean, you name it. It's really deep, deep stuff there. Um, and they've said, they've shown that if you're able to do this breathing count um, a couple times a day, I recommend at least five minutes a day. You know, we did it for a minute here. Imagine doing it for five. And there was already a massive change. I was able to connect with you in a different way. And we're on the screen. I'm in New York, you're in Florida. It's already, we're like, oh, hey. I know, uh, I'm feeling the connection. I know, exactly. Yeah, because it just takes you down a notch. I mean, I was running around this morning with errands and, and the traffic and all that. But as yeah. soon as you did that, I could feel the difference just coming down yeah. within exactly. a minute. Exactly. Minute. Imagine if you do it for five minutes. And imagine if you do it for 10 minutes. So at the refugee camp, he was doing it for 20 minutes, every 20 minutes, twice a day. So what I say, if you have a sense of urgency in your life where I was, you know, trapped by, by thoughts of suicide and thoughts of guilt and remorse, and I was so debilitated by them, I took on. The discipline you know of self-love of self-worship so much so spirituality at its foundation um it's just you know taking care of your mind so you can be able to listen to your heart so doing this breathing practice can give you a break of your narrative and then you actually are able to then start to pay attention to your breath oh now that we've done this breath now that i've done this breath where can i feel my breath most vividly maybe it's at the tip of my nose and for me, it's usually the tip of my nose. And then I, when I get distracted, when I get carried away by a to-do list or by, you know, wondering when I'm going to go back to Bali or when I'm going to meet my partner or whatever, you know, when I get taken by these stories or fear of, of what's going to happen tomorrow or anxious about or, you know, being caught in a memory from 10 years ago, whatever it is. After you do the breath, you have a little bit of space and you have a little bit of space, and that little bit of space allows you to then connect to the breath. And once you connect to the breath, all I'm proposing is that you train your mind, all the energy of the mind, to that single point. And that single point will then lead you to listen to your heart. Because we all have these moments where, you know, the heart's saying, hey, Judy, hey, Sam, whispering, hi, I'm here, you know? And some people call that intuition. I call it the language of the heart. Some people call that listening to God. Some people call that listening higher self or the soul speaking or what, you know, there's a multitude of ways that people are saying, listen to that, uh, to that voice. I call it the language of the heart and the language of the heart's right there, just waiting for us to listen and gathering energy of the mind into the breath is simple by paying attention to the breathing, reconnecting with the breath and calling the breath your home base. And again, you do that for like three or five minutes, you know? And but we talked about the nutrition, we talked about the, the breathing and the reconnection, which is super important. And you had a couple more um, levels for us to get into because yeah. um, with the stress of the holidays, yeah. uh, the people are getting very distracted. 
And so as they're learning this breathing, which is great because you're focused on the breathing, not so much what's in your mind, yeah. but we still need to have more strategies, more help to make that shift over, especially those who are on a cancer healing journey, autoimmune disease, chronic yeah. conditions where there are lots and lots of pain and inflammation. They so need this. So we really appreciate exactly. sharing more strategies for us. Exactly. So the, the, the last part of the practice, I'm just going to tackle on this, is like breathe, gather the energy of the mind into a single point, and then treat yourself to some kind words. You know, and the words that I always use in the morning and at night is may I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe, and may I live with ease. May my life not be such a struggle. And using that as a training device, you know how we started with the breath and then we use the breath again and then now using the mantra, these set of words as a training device. And again, the mind wanders off to whatever it is, to all the narrative, bring it back to these set of words. May I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe, and may I live with ease. And then each time you catch yourself judging other people or judging yourself or being critical or whatnot, which we do unconsciously, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not intentional. We, we, know, we know it's not intentional. It's unconscious. It's an unconscious habit of the mind. Treat the mind to these set of words, you know? May I be happy, may I be healthy, may I be safe, may I live with ease. And then the last two things with the primary foods, which are things that are for us to do every day. We talked about movement, we talk about spirituality, and then we're talking about the flow. What gets you to tap into the flow? What reconnects you with that moment with the things that you used to do as a child or as a young adult that you were able to be so connected so deeply with that one thing, you know, so when you was at, let me just ask you about that because that's a great point. So many people have lost their flow and they have really gotten off track. Don't have a clue how to come back on. Do you think that's caused from um, distractions of life or was it a traumatic thing that happened to them? Because of course they say, well, it's their disease or their um, circumstance. And you and I both know that's not really it. There's something many, many layers deep on that. What is your experience of why, because people want to know why they got out of the flow and then they're like, okay, now how do I get back into the flow? Mm -hmm. so, so in my work, I honored the psychoanalysis of people saying, why, do I, why did I lose my flow? But I'm all about the how do I get back on the flow? you know, uh, which is, which then we then can look at the why later with a different perspective. Then we're not trapped on the why. And then w the narratives of suffering perpetuate and our nervous system goes into out of whack and then more inflammation, more disease. Da, da, da. So <laughs> I like out. it. I like yeah. it. Go right into it, man. That's yeah. the way to do it. How do I get back into the flow? And they, you know, they say that there is a, 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 in the field of, you know, neuroscience again, I get really nerdy about this, which I love. Um, I'm not a neuroscience a neuroscientist, but I do a lot of personal uh, research and read up on all these things. So some of the things that they say is most people can tap back into the flow by reconnecting with their curiosities. What are you curious about? So write down a list of 25 things you're curious about, you know, and when you write down that list of 25 things you're curious about, look at where these clusters of things connect, you know, and be very detailed about the things you're curious about. So curiosity is one. Um, and then helping other people is another one. They call it uh, the helper's high, which you flood your nervous system with all the few good uh, neurochemicals. And you're able to you know, get high in your own supplies, how I like to call it. Um, and then, of course, the practice of meditation helps us to reconnect with the flow of work. Try to look back as a child. What were you really happy about when you were doing? You know? Was it planting? Was it playing with with uh kids was it running around like what were you what were you really excited about as a child and allow yourself to go there and as you do start to write them down and see how you could then recreate that with the conditions that you have now you know and that may may might set you off to be in flow again you know it's and hard though because people let's say i love dancing as a kid i mean i remember being two years old and and dancing to the beatles and all that stuff really? And I still love dancing, yeah. But I went through a long period where I didn't dance because I felt silly. I felt like, oh, that was when I was a kid. It's not yeah. for now. So yeah. to make that transition to, hey, I enjoyed it as a kid. Why not do it now? Was a little bit challenging in the beginning. I 100% I agree. And, and part of me, part of my personal healing path, thank you so much for bringing the dancing, has been to dance every day. And when I talk about the movement, yes, you can go out for a walk. 
but finding time to do if the things you know if the dancing is what sets you off and puts you in a state of flow and floods your nervous system and body mind heart with good chemistry and good thoughts and reconnects you with you know the energy of life the preciousness of life then we have to do what we have to do, you know? Dance like no one is watching. It does take us to get out of our own way. You know, we have to get out of our own way. We have to reconnect with our hearts so much that we become our own best friend. And I think, like you said, if we write down 25 things, um, out of those, there'll be something that we'll see that is doable. So dancing at home is easy. I don't know, I always put the music on now every day and do my dancing at home, but now I also go out to go dancing. So I made that shift. So people could start it at home in their privacy, but like you say, that's such a great tip is write down, try to write down 25 things that you would really like to go back into or explore again or try again. That's a great tip. Mm -hmm. And so the, they say that the, the 25 things, uh, the curiosity will lead to your passions and your passions will lead to your purpose. So you'd be living a meaningful life, you know? So part of this exercise is write down 25 things you're curious about and then write down 15 challenges you wish to be solved in the world and see how your curiosity could support the challenges, you know? And so the like, what do you mean when you chat, like, like, give us an example of some of these challenges. So uh, some of these challenges could be like in, in my neighborhood, there's a lot of homelessness, you know? Um, so how could I help the homeless people in the East Village in New York City? And don't get, don't be uh, Mother Teresa on us right now and think of world peace, world hunger, you know? Be, be simple about it. What can you do? What is something that you see that catches your eye? You know, maybe there's, there's kids at a, at a nearby uh, orphanage that you, you think about going out there to help them. And maybe your curiosity has been how to cook plant-based food. And you've always wanted to be a chef, but you didn't cook. And now your life is so busy and you don't really cook, but you're being very curious about cooking healthy food. So the cooking of healthy food could then lead to, to a challenge, which is to help uh, hungry uh, kids in, in the neighborhood who, who are the uh, orphans in the neighborhood. I don't know. But see how your curiosity could lead into uh, supporting that challenge. And then when you have the curiosity, you have your passions. You're connected to the heart language. And then you're connecting to a, to a purpose. And then there's flow, you know? Okay, so let's just go back to the challenges because yeah. I, I, I know my people. And they're <laughs> saying, like, wait a minute, I'm not a volunteer type, but you're really looking at it at a very small local level. So some people will look at, let's, let's throw some examples because they're going to need some. So yeah. um, animal rescue. I was just at a big animal rescue party this weekend and hundreds of people came out for it. And these are people, they might not be actually working in the kennels, but they came to support it. And they came to say, here's $25 to help. And what else maybe can I do? Oh, maybe I could see about um, this auction that I could help with that part. You know, so they were, I could see people finding their way in that animal rescue world or in their neighborhood and saying, hey, you know, I'm seeing that there's no recycle issues going on. Maybe exactly. I could get connected with, hey, start a recycling program in my neighborhood, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what else? I mean, give us some examples because this is a hard transition to, it's all about me to it's all about what's around me, right? Exactly. And, and this is one of the uh, most powerful things we can do on the healing path. I remember when I was deep down in the bottom of the pit with debilitating depression, finding ways to serve. And I'm talking about little ways to serve. You know what I mean? Like v small things you can do. So perhaps you, you love to read. And maybe there's a book from your childhood that really sparked, you know, all these feelings of love and compassion and goodness within you. Maybe you, you can find a place that you can go and, and, and read for kids. You know what I mean? Or you could go off to your nearby beach and clean up the beach a little bit. You know what I mean? Um, there's so many simple ways that we can do it. And, you know, the cooking is another one, which I know it could be great. Um, or um, going out to the, uh, if, uh, the elderly um, uh, uh, shelter or, or center and playing bingo with them. You know what I mean? Or watching a funny movie with them or dancing with them. You know what I mean? There's so many simple ways and things that we ourselves could be nour nourishing for ourselves. And then we can open up our perspective and then be able to offer that to other people. And okay. So wait, let me jump in here because, um, 
women will say yeah. this to me all the time. They say, listen, yeah. I'm already in a kind of job where I'm serving others. I'm, I'm you know, doing so many different things at work. And then I come home and I got to do things for my children, my spouse, yeah. my home, yeah. my parents. And so they feel like they're giving already all the time. And there's, that's a big part of the stress. Now that's a different type of giving, but they feel like they're expending all their energy out toward that kind of giving. What can they do to say, look, there's a balance of taking care of yourself and giving in a different way to get into your flow. Wonderful point. Wonderful point. Thank you so much for that. So then right now it's about filling up your cup. Right now, it's about you gifting yourself the time for yourself. Right now, it's about you, you know, taking a break from all those stories, all the times that you are gifting and offering and sharing and doing you. And knowing that self-care is not selfish. We are trained in society uh, that that is sort of the narrative and the standard. But the truth is, is the polar opposite. Self-care is completely, uh, of, uh, it's, you know, it's a conduit for us to be able to then do anything of, of value out in the world. And so we can be our best self. So we are solution-based beings in the world, you know. And, you know, the, the simplest thing that I can tell you to do is find out what, what helps you tap into the flow and do it for you and then one thing that i always say at a simple level is when you feel good what you could do even if it's just a glimpse of feeling good throughout the day is offer it and it could just be a simple word choice it's like i offer this you know these feelings of of of, of health and compassion i offer it to everybody who may be experiencing suffering and you just notice that that is alone floods your whole system with a more few good neurochemicals you know, and then your priorities start to change. And then we do this for a few months where it's like, I'm, I'm focusing on myself. I'm focusing on rebuilding myself. I'm focusing on reconnecting with my heart. And then after those three months of you feeling good with yourself and then offering just a simple blessing in with the mind, using the energy of the mind, right? Because we know scientific research shows that we're all completely entangled. So whatever you do or don't do is impacting everybody. You know, so when you use the power of the mind, just offer a simple blessing. Hey, I feel good right now. I wish all beings to feel good. I wish everybody to be free of, of physical and mental suffering. That will start to open you up. That That's little all shifting of the mind. No, I, I, I hear you. So there's two different aspects of this. When people are feeling depressed, anxious, panic attacks, irritability, there's two issues. One is either they are giving too much of themselves and not taking care of themselves, or they're focused too much on themselves and not learning how to serve others. So they have to determine that is what I'm hearing you say, correct? Yes, love. Beautiful way to translate this. Thank you so much. Wow, I love that. And here's the thing too. Do you enough for a little bit and then start to open up. But it'll be the natural next step. It's, it will literally be the very natural next step. Or if you find that you want to do your morning practice about you and your evening practice about others. And I'm not saying like, you know, uh, meditate in the morning with you and then go off and find ways to serve everybody every day. But, you know, maybe five days out of the week is about you servicing you, self-loving on you, opening up to your heart. And then once a week, you know, all I'm saying is one hour a week, you find a way to serve somebody else. That's serve a great you. formula. No, I like that a lot because uh -huh. that, that covers the whole gamut in a really beautiful way. That's fantastic. So... That, so we're putting it all together and giving some gold and, nuggets to everybody about how to make this shift. So once they make the shift, like the, because the holidays, is, it's going to be difficult, I know, for them. So is it uh, better to start now before the holidays right away to just jump in and do these things? Or is it better to just kind of get through the holidays and take care of themselves after? Like, what do you no, recommend no, as is they're in the depth? of yeah. their anxiety yeah. and feeling overwhelmed. What do you recommend, Sam? Thank you so much for this beautiful, honest question. Um, start now. Literally, as soon as you're done with this video, with watching this interview, you, you know, you'll go do you, honey. Um, <laughs> because here's what happens. If you, and this is what I've been telling all my clients, you know, it's like we have one week for Thanksgiving where we're sort of like, you know, one week break. And then we have one week for Christmas and New Year's. Um, and so it's three weeks. And what happens when you're poisoning your mind, body, heart for those three weeks? It will take us three to six months to, to detox the mind, body, heart garden once we start the new year. So starting now, you know, is the, the, the simplest and, and, and sharp answer that I have for you. But 
here's the thing, lovers, everyone out there, the simplest, most profound thing you can do is to start small, you know, five minutes of meditation every day, you know, 15 minutes of, of movement every day, treating yourself to a few kind words every few hours. You know, th there was a point when I was trapped and in, in debilitated by depression. I had alarms on my phone that said, sad, treat yourself kindly. So I would stop whatever I was doing. And I would say, may I be happy, healthy, and safe. And in my life, not be such a struggle. And then guess what happens? The default mindset changes. I'm not constantly nagging on the depressive states or the anxious states. That initial thing where I would judge myself immediately when I saw myself in the mirror as I was walking, whatever, I would be on that space. It would be that, 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 that beautiful, powerful, precious words that would arise in the mind. And I would be, I'll be like, oh my God, I have a supportive voice in my mind. I have a supportive thinking pattern in my mind. And that's when the beauty starts to happen, you know? Uh, so I recommend you, you start now. And in the last part of the, we talked about, I was talking about there's four main things for primary foods. We talked about movement. We talked about having a spiritual practice. We talked about flow state. And the last part is relationships. You know, having one, two, three, four, five people in our lives, but just at least one person in our lives that we can laugh with. You know, laughter is such powerful medicine. You know what I mean? When I was deep at the bottom of the pit, I didn't have anyone in America. I had to call my friend in Switzerland. You know, and I'll call her a few times a week and I'll go on FaceTime. We just laugh hysterically for 15 minutes. Sometimes we wouldn't say anything. We just knew exactly what we're on for. I needed a laugh to boost my chemistry. She needed a laugh to boost her chemistry because we're both experiencing all these debilitating states of mind. So we gift ourselves what we're there for, you know? And perhaps you might say, oh, I don't have anyone to laugh, to laugh with. Go through your list of friends and reconnect with someone from the past that you haven't talked to in a while. You know, gift them these words. Hey, I'm thinking of you. I wish you to be happy, healthy, and safe. And may you live with ease, you know? I know it takes courage to go off and do this, but you know what? This human life is so precious. It is so precious that you and I get to talk right now. You and I get to be alive and share tools for health and happiness towards a path of freedom and liberation from suffering that unless you honor, there's a sense of urgency, you know? So sending out the text message, sending out the little note, posting on Facebook or writing a letter to somebody, you know what I mean? So the relationship part is very important for us to get out of these debilitating states of mind and to be able to enter into the holidays, you know, feeling at ease and feeling in our power. And then here's the thing too, as you enter the holidays, I did a talk at Bloomingdale's and they asked me to talk exactly about this, about how to go into the holiday season in your power. And I said, pick your poison, you know, don't have the cheesecake and the wine and the cigarette. Pick one, have one of them. Yeah, yeah and you're, exactly. exactly. Just pick one. Yeah, don't go crazy on it. So let me just ask you yeah. before we um, wrap up here, uh, because uh, I could tell we could uh, have you on all day and have a great time. Um, as you were going mm -hmm. through your changes and learning how to overcome the depression, anxiety, and everything, were you able to do that completely by yourself, or did you find that it was important to have people in your life to help you and show you and support you to get through this? Absolutely, love. Thank you so much for this beautiful question. I had my sister. You know, my sister was so delicate and so gentle. Uh, she knew that in the mornings I couldn't talk to anybody because I was so hooked on these stories in my mind that she would just sit next to me at breakfast and just her eyes would speak a thousand words. Her, just her presence was enough, you know? And then we'll go off for walks on the beach and sometimes we drop a little nugget of this and that here and there. Uh, and then at the evenings, I was feeling a little bit more at ease. So then we can watch something and talk about it. Uh, and we'll cook together throughout the day. But we all need support. It takes a village. You know, it takes a village. And we might say, I don't need anything from anybody. But truth is, the money that's in your wallet, you know, you didn't put that in there by yourself. You know what I mean? The food that's in your plate, you didn't put that in there by yourself. You know, the house you're living in, you didn't build that by yourself. We all need people in our lives. So come up with a list of people who could support you on this path, you know? Um, and ask for help, ask for help, you know, have the courage to ask for help. And if you see somebody in your family who's struggling, don't be afraid of asking them, Hey, are you experiencing thoughts of suicide? What's the quality of your mental health? How can I be of support for you? Because when we heal, we, uh, when, when we are in our healing path, we're helping everybody else heal. When we're empowering other people, we're empowering ourselves, you know? Um, so small steps, 
And remember that no trauma is too big that can't be healed. We can do this. You can do this. You know what I mean? That's a big and, point because during the holidays, um, many, many people go through su suicidal thoughts. Um, they're on their cancer healing journey and they just feel like they can't go on. Uh, they've had this chronic inflammation from their autoimmune disease. Uh, they've had depression for years and years. And they just, holidays is a rough time for that, which is why I have you speaking on this because it is so important to reach out and get the help and ask. And there are people out there, many, many people out there who are willing to support. They just don't know. And so you have to open your mouth. So thank you for that. That's wise words. And I know it's coming from your heart, uh, from your mind, what you've been through in your life. So thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing all this. And if people want to get a hold of you and the work that you're doing, I also know that you've written a book. How do they do that? Mm -hmm. So the book is on, you can get it on Amazon. I have it right here. I'll just show you guys the cover so you know what it looks like. So it's called Five Minute Daily Meditations. I mean, today I sit for an hour in the morning, but I started right here, five minutes. And so I recommend you, um, you know, try and get the book if you can. And there's 365 practices that will help support you every single day of, of your, you know, of your year. And then uh, find me on Instagram. On Instagram, I get very playful about healing. You know, I share every single thing that, that I'm going through on there very openly. You know, I use dance as a medium to help me, me uh, overcome, you know, uh, uh, debilitating states of mind every day. And I share about food, everything I've shared here, all the multitude of ways that we need in order for us to heal. It's not one thing or two. There's a multitude of things that we need to do every day, but simple, simple things every day that we can do. Uh, so Instagram is at stadissimone.com. So my first and last name, Sa, S-A-H-D-S-I-M-O-N-E. Uh, on my website, if you want to do a private session, one-on-one -on -one session, I do them over Skype. I work with clients all over the world. Um, and uh, on Insight Timer, the app, it's a free app. It's where I have uh, uh, many different meditation practices on there, you know, and you will know, you will see on there that I have the breath awareness, which is the one that I shared with you guys today, resting all the energy of the mind to a single point of breath. And then the meta, compassion meditation is what I call it, which is treating the mind with these these simple, powerful, loving words towards yourself. That's fantastic. Thank you so much for that, Sa. And those of you who are watching and listening, um, just like Sa said today, as soon as this is done, go and practice this. Even just the breathing that we just did earlier, so, so simple. It's not that hard. And then go get Sa's book. If you need help, go call him up. He is there for you. Can you tell them this guy is absolutely 100% there and present to help you when you are on the healing press. So thank you again. I appreciate your experience. I appreciate everything you shared today. Great tips. Absolutely fantastic. <laughs> That's right. Those of you who are watching, those of you who are um, been on here, thank you. Please share this with everybody. It is the holidays. Lots and lots of people are going through their healing journey, and we want everybody to know about it. Okay, thank you again for watching and listening, and we'll see you on the next interview.